So welcome, and thank you for joining us tonight for our first talk of the spring semester with Dr. Michelle Chen. My name is Grace, and I wanted to start with a short introduction of our group. The Special Libraries Association student group supports students who are interested in special librarianship and is also dedicated to promoting the professional development of our members. Our talk series features distinguished library and information science leaders who are dedicated to supporting students and emerging information professionals. In addition to our talks, we partner with other iSchool students. So we have a special event coming up this Thursday where all the iSchool student groups will display a panel. So the link to the site is on the slide. Um, and then we will have a tour of the San Francisco Airport International Terminal um, together with the American Library Association student group on March 2nd at 4 o'clock. And you can email sjsualacse <laughs> at gmail.com. Um, and then to continue the work of our association, we'd be very delighted if you could co contribute your thoughts. So and appreciate your participation and, in, and by letting us know what things you are interested in to hearing about from our group. So there's a link to our um, SurveyMonkey site. And then we will also be uh, live tweeting today's talk. So our hashtag is JS, sorry, SJSUSLA. And then the talk tonight will be recorded. And then it will be posted on our website at iSchoolGroups. Um, with the extension archives at the end. And then if you are on our, our mailing list, you will receive a message with a direct link to the recording. But if you're not on the list, you can go ahead and sign up by emailing us at the email address here at sjsu.slase at gmail.com. So now I would like to introduce our president of the group, Basha Delaska Elliott. Thank you, Grace. Thank you for the great introduction. Uh, hello, everybody, and welcome to this last talk on information visualization. Uh, my name is Basha Delaska Elliott, and I chair the SLA student group. Uh, tonight, I would like to welcome and introduce our speaker, SJSU's own Dr. Michelle Chen. Dr. Chen is an assistant professor at SJSU's um, I school. Um, before joining the I school faculty, she taught at several distinguished universities, including the University of Texas at Austin, the University of Connecticut, and the University of San Francisco. Now, her primary research areas um, are teaching, um, and teaching interests include information visualization, data mining, social media, and online user behavior. And Dr. Chen is also a member of SJSU's Silicon Valley Big Data and Cybersecurity Center. So that's for the formal in introduction of Dr. Chen. But I also wanted to let you know that Dr. Chen also happens to be one of the most beloved instructors at the iSchool. I um, was fortunate enough to have taken a big data class with Dr. Chen, and I absolutely loved it. And if you have not taken classes with her yet, I hope this talk will whet your appetite. And um, now without further ado, I would like to hand the mic over to Dr. Michelle Chen. Thank you, Vaisha. Thank you, Grace. Um, hello, everyone. Can everyone hear me OK? Could you give me a smiley face or just in told yes? I saw many familiar faces here today. So I'm very happy to see some of you again. And um, again, my name is Michelle Chen. And today, it is my great pleasure to be here to give you an overview of the roles and applications of information visualization in the library field and some of the challenges and opportunities. And um, I'm trying to make it less technical, so it is kind of appealing to every one of you. <laughs> but uh, feel free to reach out to me after the talk if you have more questions or um, you know, just take my class, and I'll be happy to see some of you there, too. 
So before we jump into information visualization, I would like to first talk a little bit about why information visualization has been gaining so much attention from both academia and practice, and why we need it. So we are in the era of data storm. According to a report from International Data Corporation, from 2005 to 2020, the digital universe will grow from about 130 exabytes to 40,000 exabytes, or, for example, 40 trillion gigabytes. So for librarians and information professionals, that means some key questions have emerged from this data storm. What are the implications of this data storm? What is the best way to organize data so that it can be easily found and understood? What is the role of the information professional in this digital universe? So before we can answer all those questions, we need to first look at how data is different nowadays compared to before. So the data that I would like to briefly talk about is big data. And like Sasha mentioned, she took my big data course previously, and I know that some of you took it too. So bear with me that uh, you're hearing it again. <laughs> So I believe many of you have heard about this term or already learned about it, but what is big data exactly? So big data is really a buzzword that can carry out many different meanings and be viewed from different perspectives, depending on the domain and discipline or even on the people who actually create, use, and manage the data. But it is generally believed to be an interplay of technology, analysis, and some social issues, such as better public goods creation, privacy inclusions, and invasive marketing, um, political movements, understanding, and many more. So sources of big data include complex data from internet transactions, email, video, click streams, and all other digital sources available today and in the future. So what really makes big data different from other types of data can be captured with the four Vs, which I listed here, volume, velocity, variety, and veracity. And I'll just go through each one of them very briefly here, types of data. And we mentioned the four Vs, including volume, velocity, variety, and veracity. So the first one, the first V is volume. So volume simply refers to the increasing size of the data Social media, for example, has been known to produce a lot of researchable and actionable data every day. But some scientific data, such as climate change and forecast research data, can feed up to two, uh, 200, excuse me, 200 terabytes, and that is 10 to the 12 data per day. So um, you can see it's not only about our daily data usage, our own photos. It's not only about the social media data that we've heard a lot about, but there are also a lot of research and um, archival data that um, increase uh, dramatically every day. So the next V is velocity. And according to a previous analysis on Fortune magazine, we are actually creating five exabytes, and again, that's 10 to the 18th of digital data in recorded time until 2003. But in 2011, the same amount of data was created in just about two days. And now, by 2016, that time period has shrunk to just less than 10 minutes. And that's the velocity of the data we're dealing with. And there are actually two aspects to velocity, one representing the throughput of data, which simply means that the data moving in the pipes, and that's the, the speed of the data. And the other measure is latency. So previously, analytics is done with historical data. So if you uh, learned or heard about data mining, a lot of predictive modeling and data mining has been done with historical data. So we're using the past experience to predict future um, events. But now the analytics is increasingly being embedded in processes using data in motion or simply real-time data with reduced latency. So that is another aspect of velocity. So it's not only about the speed, but also about the latency of the data. Big data has also enabled new data integration and analytics technologies for new data formats. So the raw data can come from parsing emails and looking for information from a variety of organizations, airline tickets, online bookstore purchases, um, 
city park and tourist tickets or anything you can purchase or even pay for or any um, trajectory that you have produced when you um, use or uh, manage the data. So that is um, another aspect of the thing that we're dealing with today. That's the variety, the format. And finally, unlike, and that is something that uh, librarians and information professionals are really concerned about, unlike carefully governed internal data, most of the data, and especially the, the so-called big data, comes from sources outside our control and therefore suffers from significant uh, correctness or accuracy problems. So um, veracity exhibits in both the credibility of the data source as well as the suitability of the data for the target audience. So we must also think about the audience suitability and how much truth can be shared with a specific audience and how much, uh, how credible the data source is. So for data storms, very often these four views exist simultaneously and that increases a lot of complexity in dealing with the data and interpreting and explaining or even presenting the data. So what is the impact of the data storm on libraries and information professions? So what is happening in our field? Well, first of all, the White House's big data initiatives and policies have made one of the biggest changes around big data and libraries in the past several years. This change of policy landscape has put a greater emphasis on public access to the results of research funded by the federal government. For example, National um, Institute of Health Policy, NIH policy, requires research working as a result of NIH funding to be deposited full text in PubMed Central within 12 months of publication. This also created a momentum in other libraries to share data, and I believe that many of you have um, seen or experienced that. So for example, Harvard made public the information on more than 12 million books, videos, audio recordings, or even manuscripts and maps and more things inside its 73 libraries. So these, there are maybe a hundred different attributes for a single object. So with such abandoned information, people can create things like visual timelines of when ideas became broadly published or maps showing locations of different items. So how this action back in um, 2000, um, I think maybe in 2012 or 11, has encouraged many other libraries to allow access to the metadata on their volume, which was the start of a large and unique repository of intellectual information. So as a result, data is getting bigger and bigger and more complex. So what all arose in this data storm era? One of the most emerging technologies is information visualization, and that's our focus today. And that refers to the creation of two-dimensional or three-dimensional representations of data that enables new discoveries of insights and knowledge, or the use of computer-supported interactive visual representations of data to emphasize cognition. So both of them are great um, definitions of visualization. Um, so the, the, again, I'm trying not to get too much into the technical details here. But the two um, major things about visual, information visualization is how this can be used to um, emphasize your cognition. So how people can use different colors, different font sizes, um, different contrasts of visual elements to help people understand and uh, receive the information that the data creators or the managers want to deliver. So this figure here is just a quick example of what information visualization can do for us via visual displays. So this is a visualization created by Stanford University Libraries called Kindred Sleeping. So it shows a network of nearly 30,000 individuals, many of them are iconic big figures in British culture, and they're connected through family relationships of blood, marriage, or affiliation. So it is a vision of the nation's history as a giant family affair, and has been used to support various research areas in um, fields such as history and humanities. 
So again, just give you an idea. And um, a lot of people will think about visualization as a really like complicated and interactive system. But um, in reality, if you are, if you ever had a chance to create a simple chart from your Excel data, and that is supported as part of visualization too. So you are using some of the visual tools such as the pie charts and different colors to um, discern each part from others. All these efforts can be counted as visualization. So it doesn't have to be really like fancy and aesthetically appealing type of stuff, but um, anything that you can try to interpret and present your data from your raw text data will be part of the visualization efforts. So what has been done with information visualization in the library and information science field? Here I'd like to give you some interesting examples that show the real world applications. And um, many of us found that these application examples actually kind of ring the bell of, oh, we never thought about that visualization can be used in this way. Um, but a lot of um, kind of pioneering libraries that are actually adopting all these technologies to provide quite advanced services. So the first example here is from the Health Sciences Library at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And it partnered with the Renaissance Computing Institute to build and provide visualization infrastructure and expertise as one of the key services of the center. So with this service, Researchers can consult and collaborate with visualization experts, or some of some of them are even, um, as I've been told, there are data librarians who have expertise in visualization. So they can work with researchers to develop custom applications to help them analyze the data. So this center's visualization resources include a display wall, as you can see on the left figure. I know it's kind of small, but um, you can kind of, you can get an idea of the big picture of that with a 10 foot by 8 foot rear projection display screen capable of a really high um, resolution. And the right figure shows one example that a visual display has been conducted to aid a research on injury prevention. So here the researchers actually develop this visualization to, have to interact with very high resolution imagery inches from the screen on the display and provide opportunities for new collaborative applications or even help them to discover um, new knowledge or research questions. So that is something that um, um, this application was discussed way back when, when visualization was first adopted in the library efforts that people found it kind of um, really pioneering and um, helpful services that libraries can provide with researchers. The second example here is um, quite famous, so I would like to mention here, and it's a famous Seattle library, and it's uh, Making Visible the Invisible is a commission that houses a large open space dedicated to information retrieval and public accessible computer research. And the installation consists of six large LCD screens located on the glass wall behind the library's main information desk, as you can see from the photo on the left. And the screens feature real-time calculated visualizations generated by custom-designed statistical software using data received every hour. So this data consists of a list of checked out items, and from the list they can collect and aggregate different titles, check out time, and catalog descriptors. And um, there are approximately 22,000 items circulating per day. And you can see some visualization snapshots on the right. Again, they're kind of blurred, but uh, let me explain to you. So for example, um, one of the visualization actually features the checkout items in a chronological sequence. So each timestamp title enters the screen from the far right and slowly moves towards the left until the whole hour set of items have passed by. So the circulation of checkout books and media transforms the library into a data exchange center. And that is something that librarians and information professionals found really helpful. So it's not only about the circulation statistics or you know just books, but people are actually finding these data to be useful. They're, um, the, the flow of information can be calculated 
and I was resented regionally. And from a cultural or social pers um, perspective, the result may be a good indicator of what the community of patients considers interesting information at any specific time. And that would be really Michelle? useful for community and the library. Yes, great. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. There's a little bit of a static or background noise. Can we ask maybe the mic to be closer to your mouth? Or um, Hello? Hello, is it better now? Oh, yes, much better. Thank you. Oh, thank sorry you. about that. Oh, I'm sorry, thank you. So that's our second example. And the third example is um, more about research, but um, it has been proven to be quite useful for um, um, data uh, curation process. So that is the citation visualization example. So there have been various visualization software tools um, that are developed for capturing the relationships among authors and citations. So these visualizations reveal complex bibliographic data structures through visualizations, such as citation patterns, author relationships, leading trends and topics and cross disciplinary research, and many more. So the visualizations have become a powerful tool, not only for academic librarians, but also for end users. And uh, a lot of them were actually embedded in the search engine as well, um, in the catalog um, searches. So you can see some of those too. So these are what has been done. These are some of the key examples. So what else can be done? And I have to say that um, I need to give credit to all of my information visualization students who actually have um, helped me kind of um, put all this together along the way. So um, what else can be done? And, and this is also the question for you to think about. And so first of all, no doubt the library is a data center, a hub where information flows and is exchanged. So we can find a great variety of data in the library. So again, they are including um, circulation statistics or um, even a lot of digital archives. So here is an example from the California State Library. Um, the, the California State Library annually publishes California Library Statistics, and it is a compilation of statistical data from public and county law libraries throughout the state. And um, I was asked to help analyze the data and present the data um, just for a, 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 my, another uh, research project. But if you take a closer look at the data that we have right now, we can see that many of them are in a plain Excel format. And that seems to, unfortunately, point to nowhere. It's really a pity that we have a lot of data, but don't know how to make an effective use of it. So with information visualization, we will be able to render data in ways that um, communicate information or answer questions or even support analysis in a more uh, effective way. So this will provide our patrons with better services and organizational operations. So for example, for library patrons, the library could use visualizations to present things like current collection budgets, ebook availability information, statistics on library use, and data about the public attendance of library programming. So these types of visualizations will not only be interesting to patrons, but also provide a deeper understanding of the library's operations and the impact it has in the community. Likewise, such as in the case of the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill Collaboration Center, information visualization services will also become necessary services for many types of libraries. Visualization, um, the, uh, visualizing the library data can also be part of the library exhibition of the information for outdoor placing. So some really good infographics are useful to promote information literacy or library events. Uh, visualization can also be used to enhance patient interactions and user experience. And here is just an example to see the search engines that incorporate an information visualization tool 
And this one is specific called the Aqua Browser, and I believe that some of you may have used other types of tools before. And that, um, this type of tools presents catalog search results, um, not only in the regular format, but also includes a graphical sidebar consisting of a web of related search terms surrounding and connected to the original search term. So in this very specific tool, the larger the text are, the closer to the center term that I'm sorry, the larger the text and the closer to the center term the text are, the greater the relevance to the original search term. And the results are interactive, so you can follow paths out from your original search term and onto a relative one. So um so that gives you an idea of how information visualization can be used to uh, enhance user experience through a search engine. Another useful area of visualization um, is life in governance. So library staff could use information visualization to display physical information from the library board, county board, or even committee. The library manager could use the visualization to show how successful a new program is how budget costs are affecting certain departments and how staffing levels change over a certain period of time. And how fun speaking too. And I'm really glad to report to you that some of my students who work in a library field, um, in a library setting, they were able to use some of the visualization techniques to present such information to the board or even for some speaking. And which turned out to be quite successful instead of just presenting all the plain data they're making different um, comparisons with the visualizations, and um, people found it really kind of compelling and convincing compared to the original, you know, kind of just browsing through all the reports. And finally, understanding the data can fulfill library's social responsibility role, and that is something that I found really kind of motivating for myself. The library has a potential role in addressing poverty and its literacy. So it is suggested that demographics, statistics, and measures compiled by public libraries in designing existing often socially responsive services and programs should be coupled with some of the community profiles or school cards. So um, I have seen, or what we have seen, a lot of data intensive research be used in the collection, compilation, and analysis of such demanding data. And um, people are kind of like the graph that you see here, the adult literacy facts, and people are using kind of compiling and analyzing all this data, pulling them all together to um, address some of the social issues. And that ultimately echoes our mission of improving the well-being of our communities through effective use of information. So how can we be better prepared for the data storm and for the emerging trend in information visualization? And that is the question that I often get from um, my students. So well, here are some of my tips. I think we want to get ourselves familiarized with the data intensive related issues and problems. And if we're interested in being able to understand, interpret, and communicate large scale data sets or you know, just simply complex data sets. We can start with complete seminars, webinars, or even MOOCs to gain knowledge and skills in handling large scale data sets. But I think the key point is to let ourselves have the mindset of this is kind of the the, the, the change and um, the trends that we're facing and how and we should be we should prepare ourselves better for that. So for visualization tasks, there are actually some of the tools that we've been using, and these are, again, we're not, I'm not promoting any one of them here. Um, these are just some of the tools that provide uh, free academic license to support academic use, or um, just for students or um, instructors to, to browse through. So I think it might be some interesting tools for you kind of just to start and to try out what information visual, visualization analytics might work. So for visualization tasks, there are also many software tools that offer free trials and again for academic license. And here, these are the three options that I've been using in my classes, but of course there are many other tools that you can explore. 
So the first one is Many Eyes, which is now, I don't think it is Many Eyes anymore. It is now part of the IBM Walking Analytics. So IBM Analytics is managed and was originally developed by IBM research people. And it has been widely adopted by information visualization researchers, designers, or anyone who is interested in this area. So this is a great tool, particularly for exploratory data analysis and visualization. And the best thing about it is that it is a web-based visualization tool that so it can upgrade regardless of what kind of operating system or browser you have. Another software is Tableau. Tableau is a software that provides a great variety of visualization capabilities and most importantly, how to use those visualizations to support data analytics and decision making. And again, it provides a free academic license and a complete list of training modules to start with. And I, I found them really helpful for beginners and more advanced learners in this field as well. And the third software is the one that I've been using, not in the information visualization course, where it said in my big data class. And it's called Splunk. So Splunk provides an integrated platform to search and analyze and also visualize especially machine data, which means the data coming from, say, web logs or um, a browser history. So again, it provides different capabilities for querying and visualizing data. And Splunk acts more like um, Splunk acts more like um, a, a database software, so you are actually using some of the query languages to query and search from your data, and the visualization results will be generated and created based on your data. And I see Heather's comments here, and that is also what I learned too. So, um, and I've seen a lot of research articles that talk about how Tableau has been used in their libraries to help um, a lot of different data analytics tasks. And that is something we'll be using in um, my information visualization class, too. So again, I'm trying to just give a big picture of the role and applications of information visualization in our field. And there are a lot of um, technical or theoretical aspects of visualization. For example, there are many different design principles when you want to create an infograph or um, there are a lot of different perceptual properties that you should uh, consider when you design a um, um, visualization. For example, um, people, human perception can act quite differently when they receive different color information or different um, or hue or saturation, different, you know, kind of a vision um, based on the how, how the vision works. So there are different aspects of it, but um, I'm trying to provide a bigger picture, um, kind of a just intro session for you to understand and kind of um, get a big picture of how it works in um, information, um, library and information science field. So um, again, thank you very much. I know we have some technical pickups in between and thanks for your patience and I hope it has given you a broad understanding about what this information visualization is and how information visualization has been used and applied in our field, and especially to think about what we can do to learn more about it and how we can use that to enhance our daily work or even our analysis work or the way that we present or present, uh, interpret our data. So questions and comments are greatly appreciated. Feel free to drop me an email. Um, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Uh, Michelle, there's a question on the chat from Chanel going back to the Seattle library example. It looks like this data is being displayed in a very public way, correct? If so, what are the related privacy concerns for patrons? This is a great question, and believe me, that's always a question about um, privacy concerns and um, issues related to um, kind of the invasive data analysis. That's what people call. So, um, 
in this example, as far as I understand, we are not using any um, identifiable information or sensitive information. All these are just public like circulation data statistics, and I'm just trying to make it kind of a one time to make it more uh, informative from the data. So it's not just a bunch of circulation data itself, but it's making it more like at a given point of time, what is the community's interest, or um, what is, for example, what is the title that has been most checked out in the last 24 hours, let's say. So um, I believe that, <laughs> but don't quote me on that, but I believe they're not um, invading or um, using any kind of a private information or sensitive information from the patrons. But I do agree with you that that is a very, um, that is the key question that we have to take into account. And we do, uh, like in my, all my information visualization courses, we do have a session that focuses, or even big data courses, we have a session that focuses on all those issues, the privacy concerns, and the data. And people are also questioning that um, it's not only about the privacy issues, but the way that people use, kind of overusing the data, whether it is a good thing or not. Um, so what I mean is that if we depend too much on the data to interpret or explain something, and sometimes it can be, it can lead us to a wrong way if we're just depending too much on that. So that is another kind of concern or different aspect of people having issues dealing with all this data. So um, I'm, I'm not sure if I answered that question perfectly, but um, just wanted to recognize that it is, it is indeed a key question that people have concerned about. And um, and I think that it's also our responsibility as librarians and information professionals to always keep in mind those issues when we generate and curate our data. So what is the privacy concerns and are we um, invading any um, sensitivity or privacy issues there? Thank you very much, Michelle. Um, do we have any other questions? You can raise your hand or just write in the chat box. I have a question. Oh, go ahead. Thank you. I don't. I didn't. I actually wanted to comment. So if you have a question, go ahead, and I can wait. Oh, no, it's it's okay. I, I I had a silly question about the last slide with the thank you in many different languages. Um, I was just wondering if it was if you decided on the size or w w is that based on some data that you had on which languages most used thank you in a certain context? <laughs> That's a very interesting question, and honestly, I've never really thought about that. This is just a very common word cloud that has been used in the interview community that shows thank you. So I can look it up. Um, I think that is a great question. It's not silly at all. I can look it up and I can share with you more information about it, where it comes from and what is the research space uh, it is based on. <laughs> it's a good question. I wanted to say, and uh, this is a little bit also in response to um, Grace's question and, and um, sort of wondering if it's silly to look at these kinds of things and ask these questions, that um, the big data class and the part on um, information visualization specifically really kind of changed for me the way I have looked at many things. And I have been able to use the skills I learned in that class in so many classes other classes and one of the things they learned was that just looking at data without graphically representing it sometimes is not enough to actually be able to interpret it. So thank you for that, that I, <laughs> teaching me how to do that, um, Michelle, but I also wanted to, uh, you know, bring it to everybody's attention. This is sort of an interesting exercise. Thank you, Marcia. I really appreciate your kind words. And, um, and I do agree that, and, and I think you also kind of brought up one important uh, usage of information visualization. It is not only about analyze or interpret your data, 
So a lot, a lot of times it can help you kind of discover new knowledge or even identify potential problems in your data. And that's something that we found really helpful too. So it's not only about presentation, you know, kind of transform your data into some fancy graphics, but it is also about how you can use information visualization to help you discover new knowledge or insights from your data. And I see another question from Heather here. This is a great question, and you know what? Fortunately, a lot of current software actually takes take care of much of the design work. So um, it just depends on the way that you format your data and the way you input your data. But once you feed your data into the software, you can pretty much generate a lot of different types of visualizations. So it can start from really basic charts like um, pie charts or column charts to quite fancy ones such as the one that you saw here, the, the word clouds, or um, you, if you have geographic information, you can map at them on the word map. Um, there are also different types of uh, more advanced types of visualization such as the tree maps where you can actually um, kind of break down your data based on the proportions. So, um, so all this software actually can, can kind of take care of the design work. But in terms of putting all the data, all the graphics together into, let's say, a complete infographic or even like something like a poster, then that might need a lot more um, expertise or experience in um, graphic design, I would say. So for some of the infographics that that you saw from, let's say, the um, New York Times. Um, there are many different, uh, there are, a lot of them are quite famous um, visualization designers, and they actually put a lot of effort in all this aesthetic consideration for which elements should be placed in which place. So things like that, so that part of the design work needs a lot of um, training and experience. But as far as, you know, just kind of into the data and get your visualization, a lot of software nowadays can take care of that part. I see that people are typing, so let's wait for a couple. It looks like we may have a couple more questions coming up. I think you should also feel free to grab the mic if you want to ask a question. I, I just wanted to remind everyone we're also going to stay around after the talk if you want to uh, get to know other students and have a discussion. So we'll be here for a few minutes or half an hour after the talk. Uh, we have a question from Isis. Um, she had a similar question to Heather's. It has to do with web tools. If you are using a web a website to make your data look nice, who owns the data and the design? Let's say a tag cloud on Tuxedo, copyright wise. That's a great question. And that really depends on the website provider. So you have to really be careful about that. So many eyes, the example that I just gave, um, the data will be um, public. You still own the data and the design, but everyone else can be able to can view and or even download and save your design. So, it, so for many eyes, it makes it really clear that you are not uploading or um, making it public the data that is, um, let's say, proprietary, protected, or um, personal data or sensitive data. So it makes it really clear that and I think you need kind of you need to go through some of the check boxes to make sure that this is the data that you want to share it. You still own the data and the visualization, but again, people can just view the data freely on the web. So um, so that's a great question and that is something uh, we have to be really careful about. Um, well feel free to take on the mic if, if we have any questions. If not, um, we can stop the recording.
Okay. Well, thank you, Michelle, very much for the wonderful talk and the um, great discussion about data and visualization. And thank you for taking the time to do this for us <laughs> tonight. Uh, we very much appreciate you being here for our talk series. So big hand for Michelle. <laughs>